The start of the long countdown for Apollo 11 now is one day away with liftoff scheduled a week from today. There was one distraction from the moon mission today. Walter Cronkite reports. This is the rocket that will carry men to the moon. On the eve of the countdown, this is pad 39A. The countdown begins tomorrow, 8 p.m. in the evening. A five and a half day count leading to a launch at 9.32 a.m. next Wednesday, and hopefully a landing on the moon a week from Sunday. As we wait to go to the moon, mankind's more normal preoccupations continue. A test launch here today, not of a spaceship to explore the universe, but a Poseidon, the Navy's new long-range submarine-based missile, which is to replace the older Polaris rockets aboard our nuclear submarine fleet. Yet today, the launch of a weapon was only a momentary distraction. The focus remained on the moon. Three men on the way to the moon. And a week and a half later, three men on the way back from the moon, our first voyagers from another world. A magnificent moment, and just possibly a menacing one. Back from the moon, the end of the strangest of man's voyages, and the beginning of an epilogue just as strange. This is how it will be. These films show the Apollo 11 crew rehearsing for recovery, and for a treatment more worthy of lepers than of conquering heroes. The frogmen who reach Apollo 11 will handle it like a plague ship, remaining upwind as the hatch opens just long enough for one of them to throw in three plastic sacks containing so-called bioprotective garments. Even the astronaut's breath will be filtered before it is allowed to touch the air. All part of a three-week quarantine stretching back from the moon and halfway around the Earth to the lunar receiving laboratory in Houston. A quarantine designed to head off the wildly unlikely chance of some harmful organism returning from the moon to plague the Earth. The astronauts will be isolated in a trailer on the recovery vessel. The trailer will be unloaded in Hawaii and then flown to Houston with the astronauts still inside. In Houston, we talked with the man in charge of the NASA quarantine, Dr. Walter Kemmerer. Can we look at the trailer? Why, surely. Like a small airplane cabin in here. Yes, indeed. Oh. Well, very much like it. The, looks like you got kind of airplane type seats. Right. Indeed, of course, the, the crew will actually fly in the, in the trailer aboard an aircraft. So it must meet the requirements uh, of an aircraft in many ways. Well, now you've got them here to Houston in this box. Now what happens? Well, the trailer, the mobile quarantine facility, is offloaded from the aircraft at Ellington Field and is then wheeled, literally, out to the manned spacecraft center. And there the uh, trailer is backed up to the building and the crew members then enter the building through a, a little, very short tunnel-like arrangement. The Lunar Receiving Laboratory itself, sealed quarters for the three astronauts and some 15 technicians who will share their quarantine. Bedrooms for the astronauts and scientists, dormitories for the others. A lounge area complete with television and a library, though the astronauts won't have much time here. They'll be going through endless debriefings as the 21 days of quarantine drag by. Kitchen facilities, mostly for defrosting frozen meals, slipped in through airlocks. Yet already, some scientists are warning that the whole elaborate procedure is insufficient protection for the only planet we've got. Cornell University soil expert, Martin Alexander. We need to have a far better quarantine, a quarantine which would protect human beings, which would protect the higher animals that we use as food, the plants that we require, and also the variety of other organisms that are necessary to maintain life on the surface of this planet. But Dr. David Sensor, head of the Communicable Disease Center in Atlanta, who headed the government committee that drew up the Apollo 11 quarantine, is convinced that it is good enough to protect us. The quarantine procedures that we have developed, I think, are not just practical, foolproof from a practical standpoint, but foolproof from the standpoint of human knowledge. There are many deficiencies in NASA's quarantine program. For one thing, it is far too short.
there are many terrestrial diseases which require longer periods of time for their expression. Well, just about any disease that we can postulate that they might contract would have an incubation period of less than 21 days. The organism causing leprosy, the bacterium causing tuberculosis, and the organisms causing syphilis would not make their harmful effect noted until after 21 days. I think any quarantine procedure has to take account of the probabilities as well as the possibilities. The 21 days is beyond the probability of most infectious diseases. These are among the other serious criticisms of NASA's quarantine. The astronauts are healthy men. Critics say they might become carriers of disease that wouldn't affect them directly. Cosmic typhoid marries, endangering the less fit among us. The critics point out that there are no live food animals in NASA's test menagerie and no mature food grains, even though some earthly crop diseases are known to attack only the mature plant. Critics are even more disturbed by NASA's announcement that if some serious known condition should strike the astronauts, a heart attack, say, and the lunar receiving hospital could not handle it, quarantine would be broken sufficiently to get the victim to a hospital. Summing it all up, the most outspoken opponents of NASA's plans charge that the space agency is not really serious about this quarantine, but is simply trying to soothe the rest of us. I have spoken to a number of individuals involved directly or indirectly with the Apollo program, and their feeling has been that by and large, most of the value of the quarantine program is to convince the public that there is a quarantine, and not that there really is an effective barrier to extraterrestrial forms of life. There are two factors uh, in this. One is the probability that something is going to happen. Uh, and in this case, that's very, very low. Now, the, the second factor is, uh, what is it that we're insuring? Now, in this case, that's the terrestrial biosphere, or life on Earth, which is very, very valuable. And these two together are what make up the, the overall program uh, import. Many people we find look, let's say, only at the, the probability alone. They say, well, this is so improbable that, that uh, uh, maybe we're doing too much. Uh, other people look uh, only at, at that which we're insuring, and they say, gee, that's so important uh, that we really should do more. Now, somehow, uh, reality tells us that it's actually the melding of these two together uh, that make up our, our overall program. The chance of danger from the moon is so small that it is almost zero. But until Apollo 11 returns, no one on Earth can close that tiny gap between theory and fact, between almost zero and zero, until the moment the astronauts open that hatch in the Pacific and settle the question forever. That very tiny chance of a very grave danger will be part of our lives. Water Crown Guide, CBS News, Manned Spacecraft Center, Houston.